everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, and I'm glad to be here and share with you how we leverage Flink to help prevent ship groundings in rivers and ports. So my name is Roy. I'm uh, the engineering league at DocTech. Uh, and first, I want to show you this. A grounding incident can have dire effects. This is an example. This is the MV Wakashio, which was a bulk carrier that ran aground near the Mauritius Coral Reef in July 2020. And I don't need to explain this picture. You see how significant it could be to uh, try and help prevent ship roundings. And with that significance in mind, I want to start the presentation, and, just the, and then I'll show you how we try to do what we do. So what are we going to be talking about? First, a little bit of who we are, who is DocTech, and what we do. Um, then, a little bit about the maritime world. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the concepts and terms and the definitions, so a little bit of overview, just to be able to understand ship groundings and this world. Uh, then, a little bit about ship groundings, when can it happen, how can it happen, and the effects. And then we'll dive in into the real-time prevention solution that we implemented uh, using Stateful Flink. And then, uh, a little bit of what, what can we expect ahead. So DocTech is a small startup company uh, collecting data from active work puts within uh, rivers and ports, um, and mostly uh, collecting data to map environmental and topological conditions. And in the use case that we're going to be t discussing today, it's mostly position and bathymetry, meaning depth and position data. Uh, we have three main f uh, products. The first is Aquascope AI, which is the flagship product. Uh, it is used to transform observations, the data that we collect, into actionable insights for the port authorities and the river authorities. Uh, for example, uh, a real-time depth map of the environmental conditions of uh, the port environment. And then we have VAX, which is the tool that we're going to be discussing today, which is the grounding and geofencing prevention for workboats. Uh, and then we have a third tool also, which monitors the sensor health, because we collect data from sensors and we monitor the health and uh, we know to alert if there's some kind of malfunctioning uh, sensor. Okay, so some key definitions. You can see it's color-coded to help you understand uh, in terms of the vessel. Depth, I think you're all familiar with. It's the vertical distance between the water level and the bottom of the sea. Draft is how sunken is the ship in the water. So it's the vertical distance between the water level and the bottom of the ship. The ship. So it's measured in three different places, mostly because when we load a vessel or the weight shifts, then it can be different in different kinds of areas, the bow, the stern, and the middle. So we measure it in three different places. Underkeel clearance is the vertical distance between the keel, which is the most lowest part of the, shi of the ship, and the bottom of the sea, which is an important definition. We'll, we'll, we'll understand why uh, uh, soon. And tide is obviously the changes of the water level uh, caused by the gravitational forces between Earth and the moon and the sun. Dredging is the process of excavation of material or soil from a water environment. So you can see a dredger on the top right corner. This is one kind of dredger. There's all kinds of them. And it's basically used to take the, the ground from the river environment, from the port or river environment, and take it somewhere else, maybe to a shore and maybe to the uh, uh, deep sea. Bathymetric surveying is the process of measuring the depth in transact lines and plotting that into a bathymetric chart, which then the port authority or the river authority uses in order to know what is the, the depth at each and every point of the uh, port environment. And then sensors, these, as I said, are the ones we're going to be focusing on, which is GPS, the positioning system, and the echo sounder that is used to measure the depth. And I just want to point out, you can see in the top left corner, that the transducer of the echo sounder is not necessarily located on the keel, meaning it's not at the lowest part of the ship. So we need to take into account this offset between the transducer and the keel and the transducer and the water level. So the maritime wall, this is the S100 is a, a framework for geospatial hydrographic data. And you can see that there's a lot of different data sources in a marine or port environment. So yeah, there's data everywhere. 
OK, so what, what's the risk of touching ground? In a port or river environment, most ports are not naturally deep, and rivers are shallow near the banks. So cargo ships like tankers or container ships that want to go into the port to unload their cargo, they need to know that they can do so safely without any risk of touching ground. So the port environment, which is the, usually the authority that is required to maintain this environmental condition, it needs to uh, give them the, the safety of knowing they can go in and go out easily and safely. How do they do that? So they start by surveying the required areas every set period of time and dredge them if they need to, if, it, if it's necessary. When they need to dredge, they usually dredge more than they need because they assume there's sedimentation of the seafloor, meaning the, the, floor, the seafloor shifts, the, the ground underneath the water shifts. So they assume it happens, even though they don't really necessarily know that it does happen. So they dredge more than they need to, to have like a safety margin. And then after they do that, they issue the UKC definition, the underkill clearance definition, that this is the definition that the, the ship owners and the ship operators know to use if they can go in safely. So assuming I am a ship owner and I know my draft is 16 meters, but the UKC definition that the port gave me is 15 meters, I'm not able to go into the port and unload. I need to go to another port. So that's why this definition is very uh, important. It's also important to know that this definition is usually reduced by the port over time. Because as I said, they assume the, the ground, the seafloor shifts. So they don't necessarily know, so they have to take the safety margin and just reduce it. So what are the effects of a grounding incident? So we'll start with the ship owner. So as you can see from the MSC Napoli, uh, which ran aground near the Devon coast in the UK, it, it's a life-threatening event for the crew members. If assuming that these, this ship had crew members on it, they're in, they're in danger because this ship might drown, might sink, and, and the crew members can drown. Also, this ship will probably need heavy repair work. So it, this is also costly for the ship owner. Also, there's lost work time because this ship was supposed to continue its voyage to other ports, unload and load more cargo. So this, this, this work time is now lost. And eventually, as like any other incident, as you might happen to you with your car or something like that, you know that usually there's increased insurance costs. How about the port or river authority? So this example, you can see, I'm sure you're all familiar with it. It's, this is the Ever Given who blocked the Suez Canal from, uh, in uh, March 2021. And you can see already that it uh, incurred lost business of that ship because this ship will probably not unload its cargo. It also incurs lost business during the salvaging operation because usually the terminal or the, the, the area of the, the ship that gets uh, ran aground is, is stuck. So other ships can go in, so it's lost business for the Port Authority. There's reduced credibility. Now that I know this, there, there's been an, a grounding incident in that terminal or in that port, I'm more afraid to go in as a ship owner. So reduced credibility and, again, increased insurance costs. And then we have the example that we saw earlier for the public. This is possible environmental implications, like an estimated of 10,000 tons of oil spilled to a, a marine habitat. There's supply chain delays. I'm order, I ordered an Amazon package. I'm probably going to have delays in getting it because maybe it was on the cargo ship that ran aground. And there is increased cost of living usually because whenever there's supply chain delays, usually it involves increased uh, cost of living. So the, we want flink sinks. We don't want these kind of sinks. OK, what are the challenges? So there are a lot of challenges. I'm going to share only some of them because we don't have a lot of time. So one of the most crucial ones uh, is noise. I don't know if you work with sensors. Marine sensors specifically and generally sensors are noisy. So you can see here on the example on the right, the data is not always clear when and what. And we need to clean this, clean this uh, data in order to know what is the trend and what is exactly is the correct measured value. So yeah, sensors can be noisy. and. Also, there's noise everywhere, even there's dead everywhere. 
an environmental challenge is the tide variation that we saw uh, in the start. So the measured depth is affected, as I said, by the gravitational forces in the moon of the sun. And this is an example of two weeks of tide variation in Hamburg port, right close to us, uh, here in Germany. And this is, uh, you can see, in just like a 12-hour time span, there's three meters difference. So this can be very significant when and when did we measure a certain point to know what is the tide to, to eliminate this value. Okay, let's dive into the solution. So VAX is a management tool for the fleet managers and the mariners built of the onboard sensors. And it's built as a, it's based on a model of a deterministic finite automata, which is basically a state machine. So that's why we needed Flink. I'm going to get to that. First, I want to tell you about a term that we use in Doctic a lot, that is symbiotic interoperability. So basically, it's in, our, in our context, it's the ability of the software component to be beneficial for one another. So there's VAX, who's which is collecting data constantly. It's getting the data from the, from the vessels operating inside the Port or River ent environment. Then, at the end of each day, Aquascope generates the daily depth map that is produced in that, in that uh, area, in that port environment. Then that data is, is, taken, is taken into account by VAX in order to uh, uh, reduce the noises and, and eliminate the noise that it usually gets. So we have the daily depth, uh, the daily, uh, depth, depth map. This is an example from Santos Port, and, uh, Santos Port that we saw earlier. And this is one month of data. So you can see that on the right, the, it is collected from seven different kinds of vessels. So when you take into account other vessels and you get a clearer picture of what is the depth at each every, and every point, once you get now an observation, you can compare it if you need relative to the depth map. And then you, if, if it's noise, you can easily eliminate it. This is one of the ways to eliminate the noise. So what is the logic? Uh, as I said, it's a state machine. So what are the states and the transition? So we have the initialization state, which takes roughly 20 seconds. It's modifiable. And it's mostly in order to accumulate a sufficient number of observations, just to, to be able to process the observations. Then we have the monitor state, which usually the vessel is in the monitor state, because most of the time, it's not a ground. It's not in a shallow water environment. So this state constantly evaluates the observations and checks for the potential shallow water. Then we have the warning states. In a case where we identify a situation that there might be shallow water or, or a shallow environment, then this is kind of a pre-alert state that in this state and in the alert state that we're going to get to, these are the states where we check for the, when we compare the data with the data produced by Aquascope AI in order to eliminate the noise and be absolutely certain that this is actually a shallow water and not some kind of noise or quick jump in the measured value. And then we have the alert state, when, which is when we're in a, an active alert, an active incident. So when we know that we have a shallow area, this is the, the uh, state that we're, the, the state machine is in. And this state, uh, uh, issues the update messages downstream in the Flink uh, in the Flink uh, application that we're going to talk going to going to be talking about uh, in order to know when the uh, incident started when does it end uh, when does it end and if there's any updates during the alert during the incident. Two other states that you can see on the left that are a bit uh, uh, they usually we do hope not to get to them but sometimes we do is the pause state when there's no data. So if there can be uh, situations where maybe there's no uh, good internet connection, or maybe someone tr accidentally, the crew member has turned off one of the sensors, something like that, so we don't get data. In that time, we go to pause state because we don't get data. And then whenever we start, we get, start getting back data, then we go back to initialization state. And then there's the board state, which is the error state. Whenever there's something wrong with the code, whenever there's something, I don't know, some exception that we didn't thought of, uh, then it goes to an abort state, and then it tries to reinitialize. Uh, and obviously, this state sends logs for us to know what was the cause of the problem so we can investigate. 
I'm going to quickly run over the geofencing logic, which is when we try to know if a, a ship is in a place, a kind of a no-go area, a place that it sh shouldn't be in. As you can see, most of the states are relatively similar, other than the alert state, because the logic is different. All we want to do here is know if, this, if the vessel is inside some kind of polygons that is predefined and we know we don't, we don't want to be in, or it's not in that polygon. So it depends on the GPS accuracy, but mostly when G the GPS is accurate, then there's a lot less considerations uh, uh, to take in uh, when you're talking about, when you're comparing it to a shallow water detection. This is the overall architecture. So as I said, we're a small startup, so we use a lot of managed services to, uh, uh, to get the functionality that we want. And we work a lot with AWS, so a lot of the services are based on AWS services. I'm going to quickly run, this, uh, run over this just to give you uh, uh, a knowledge of what's happening. So we get the data through the IoT core, which is where, uh, because sensor data is usually like telemetry data, so we get it through IoT core. And then we diverge it to two data streams, position and depth, because the data doesn't come consolidated. It comes in uh, updates of each of the sensors. And then we have uh, a Flink cluster, a Flink application, in order to consolidate the data. So we want to take the data from each, from each vessel. This is the key. And we consolidate by the timestamp. So meaning we get a depth reading and a G uh, GPS reading. We want to have the same reading at the same time as one message. So we consolidate the data. And then we take that data as input into the state machine Flink application, which does the, this is the logic that we talked about earlier. Um, as I said, whenever is needed, then the state machine takes data from the reduced bathymetric uh, database, which is based on Iceberg, in order to be able to know if it's noise or not. And also there's uh, uh, enrichment and the metadata for the no-go areas for the geofencing, as I said, the predetermined no-go polygons uh, that are loaded as static data right from the start whenever we uh, uh, initiate the, appli the application. Eventually, as I said, uh, when there's an alert, then start and end and update messages are uh, forwarded downstream. And uh, through a Kinesis data stream, they go to a Lambda function, which we use in order to uh, send to an SQS that then the user gets an immediate uh, alert. Uh, usually, it's the fleet operator that sits in the operating room, not operating room, but the operations room. Um, and we store the, the, the document of the incidents inside a MongoDB uh, database. Also, I didn't mention then the data, the consolidated data that we aggregate is then also stored into an iceberg consolidated data, data lake, um, basically because we also give the users the opportunity the, the option to investigate an incident if it did happen. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you that later. So we'll talk about the Flink applications. First, there's the consolidation application. It's relatively straightforward. We use the Flink SQL, uh, the Flink SQL API. It's a streaming ETL. It's written in Python. We use PyFlink. Uh, and as I said, it's, part it's used to partition the, the data by the UUID of the device that we connect device to a vessel. We know which device is on which vessel. It's joined uh, by UUID and the timestamp, enriched with data we need later on, and deduplicated. So we have two inputs. Um, the enrichment is uh, performed using Python uh, user-defined functions and external libraries that we use. Uh, and the deduplication is using the uh, row number top and query with a tumbling window. It's important to note that in this Flink application, we don't really care about the state because um, once we consolidated the data and we stored it in the Iceberg data lake, then we don't need this data anymore in this application. So we don't need a big state. That's why we use, we use, uh, we use hash map state backend, uh, and it reduces the, the overall latency and the overall uh, computations. The VAC state machines application. So in, this is a, more, a much more complex application. We use the data stream API along with a key process function. It's also written in PyFlink. Um, and as, I, as you saw, there's one input and one output. The consolidated data is the input, and the outputs are the downstream messages of the start or end or update of events. Um, in this application, we do manipulate this state directly using uh, map state and value state descriptors. 
but the, the states themselves are basically Python classes. We utilize Python classes in order to, uh, to generate the states and the transitions as methods of the classes. A little bit about the keyed process function. So in the init method, we uh, initialize both the Python state, the, the class, and the, the fling, and fling state. And in the open one, we, uh, the open method, we you initialize the value and map state within the runtime context. The process element uh, method of the keyed process function is the one that uh, is used to constantly evaluate each, obser each obser observation as it comes. Uh, and it uses the process method of the Python class we're currently in. Uh, and if there's an alert, then the process element is the one that takes the data from the state and, uh, and sends the message downstream in order to produce it to the Kinesis data stream. Python states, as I said, it's Python classes that store the current state and, and uphold the logic. Uh, we have the transition method and the process, which are the most crucial ones uh, that they, they perform the logic that we talked about earlier. And as I said, again, whenever there's an alert, the process element uh, function previously in the key process function, that's the one that initiates the update messages. Um, a little bit about the application structure. So because we use Amazon MSF, ma Managed Service of Flink, so there's the structure that this specific uh, runtime requires, which is the main, uh, the main function, the main entry point uh, is at the top level, the root level. And we have, we have to have an Uber jar, meaning we have, to, uh, we have to pack all of the Java dependencies in an Uber jar and place it in, a, in the lib directory. And all of the other code, including our own code for the logic of the Python states and everything, it also needs to be as an external Python library located in, Py in, in a specific directory called Python dependencies. Or the, n the name doesn't really matter, but another, uh, another directory to contain all the external libraries. So a, a quick example. Um, the case of Ila das Ostras. We work a lot in Brazil. And on March 8th, 24, uh, the rope connecting two of the tugboats with that we monitor uh, to the buoy broke and they drifted away. Luckily, there were no crew members on board, but the salvaging operations took 15 hours. The two of these two tugboats, they ran aground uh, at an island called Ila das Ostras uh, in Itaguaí port. And I want to show you a quick uh, video that shows uh, this was whole, all, all of this was captured in VAX. And I want to show you right when you can see everything. So you can see here. This is the platform, and you can see on the right the timestamp. I hope you can see that. Uh, it runs very fast because uh, it took a lot of time because they drifted. And then now you can see the, the echo sounder. So you can see the measurement. It starts with 3.2 meters, and it quickly drops to 1.2 meters eventually, where the, the big yellow area that you see, this is where they ran aground, and they stayed until they, until they were salvaged. So eventually, they got to 1.2 meters. And we identified this already at like 3.3 uh, 3 meters, which was the threshold that they, the company that we work with, they, they told us that this is the threshold they want the alert in. And assuming there were uh, uh, crew members on board, they can start the engine and go right out there. So they could prevent it if there were crew members on board. So yeah, Flink can save lives. <laughs> Um, a little bit about the future. So um, what we plan to do is, for example, uh, uh, one example is use idle tugboats as tight stations. So a lot of areas, mostly around ports and rivers, are we don't have tied buoys to measure the tide in those areas. And it's important for an, a lot of uh, stakeholders, not only uh, companies like us, but also weather companies and stuff like that. So we checked and we saw, as you can see on the right, that tide, the, the, when the tugboats are idle, when they're not doing anything or just standing, we can use that data to simulate, not to simulate, to predict and maybe even know the exact tide at that, at, at that area at that time. So using idle tugboat as tide stations is one example of a good use. Also, carbon emissions monitoring. So there's a lot of regulations around carbon emissioning, as you probably know. And we plan to also connect sensors to go monitor carbon emissions around ports 
because this also uh, starts to be heavy, heavily regulated. Um, and the last thing is uh, predictive maintenance. As I said, we also monitor uh, the sensors, the sensors' health, and we are starting to use models in order to try and uh, uh, see when can when does um, uh, a sensor will start to fail, and when when should the company do predictive maintenance to it. So uh, yeah, thank you for listening. If there's any questions. Thank you for a great presentation and giving us business context. Um, I'm curious if you could please uh, go back to the architecture. Yeah. Um, there was there was something that like yeah this this slide yeah. uh, in a vac state machine there is less re reduced dynamic bathymetry db yeah. uh, like data being used within within a uh, fleeing job. Yeah. Is it like uh, re regular qu querying or, or, or like like ad hoc querying or is it like fetching some of the of this DB to, to state, because the like, querying may look a bit like slow, right? Yeah, so that's a great question. So whenever there's a potential shallow water, yeah, you're right, we need to query the data from the reduced, uh, the data, the database is uh, optimized for querying, but it still can be slow for what we want. So whenever there's a first and initial sh observation where we think there might be shallow water, we take the data and then we store it. So whenever there's, we need to uh, again try and see if the data is indeed a shallow water, we already have the observations or the data in that area, so we don't really need to query it again. So that way we reduce it. And eventually when a vessel moves, it doesn't move very fast. So data we already queried will probably be enough. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, it was a very interesting topic. Uh, I was curious if you can share some uh, some experiences from running PyFlin in production, because uh, we were also exploring the one potential option, but uh, compared to Java Flink ecosystem, it seems a little bit less polished and less mature, so I wonder like, what was your experience? So, actually, the experience was good. There was a lot of challenges at the start in, in uh, implementing it, mostly because I think it, there, there are difficulties of implementing Flink in general. There is a lot of things you need to understand. There's a lot of versions that you need to find the right one that you're using. Um, specifically, Python for me and for us in the company was relatively easy to implement, but it's, I think it's important to know that uh, eventually with with, we're not a, a huge company, as I said, so we don't have a very big scale. But when you have scales and you need like real-time, uh, uh, real-time updates or real-time, uh, actual real-time, then maybe Python will not be the best solution because, as we all know, Python is is much slower than than Java. So I think that's w m the most important uh, consideration to take when when thinking about using utilizing Python. And in terms of stability, you didn't have any significant issues? No, actually in that, it was pretty smooth for us. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I have a couple of short questions. First one, uh, when you use bathymetric data, is that local data? So you have an area that you have good coverage of a bathymetric data and you kind of only work within that area or is that something you're planning to expand, let's say along a route? Great question. So. As I showed earlier here, I'm gonna get back to it real quick. So you can see that the port environment is not, is not small, but because we work with work boats, meaning tugboats or barges, they usually only work inside that port. So they always cover the same area, not necessarily in the same time all the time, but we, can, we, we take from different kinds of vessels. So that's why we usually get very good coverage, like say, let's say in a time span of at least uh, two weeks, we usually get good coverage. Yeah. That's impressive. Yeah. And the other question I had is that having this sort of almost foolproof safety mechanism has probably really positive implications for insurance. So is that something that you, you have considered? And yeah, we actually considered uh, um, 
taking a business aspect in the insurance side, but we, we were on the making of it. We're not, yeah, it's not fully developed. It takes time also for the insurance companies to really trust your technology and know that it works. So it takes a lot of time to make the, make the uh, market trust your technology, and especially insurance. So, but, but we're in the making of it, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, thank you.